we got a really an amazing group of distinguished scientists, writers, uh, academicians. Uh, so right, I'm, right next to uh, Marianne, we have uh, Jacques Vallée. Dr. Jacques Vallée, let's make it very clear. Jacques, uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée is, um, uh, was born in France. He is a, stands tall amongst those investigators who, of the Fortiana, of the, uh, everything that ranges from remote viewing to uh, extrasensory perception to aerial uh, phenomena, UFOs. But at the same time, Dr. Vallée also led a dual life, which was, he was one of the early pioneers in the creation of the ARPANET. Um, so uh, he is here with us. He's actually uh, very rarely makes any kind of appearances, he, and I'm very happy to have him in New York, uh, Dr. Uh, For those who saw uh, Close Encounters of the Third Time, directed by uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, there was a fellow uh, there, uh, played by uh, François Truffaut, who uh, actually, uh, whose uh, work was basically, the Dr. Bellet was the inspiration for that. So, uh, he is a... Yes, uh, yes. So, uh, hello, hello, can you hear on? Maybe, turn it on, the microphone. Hello. Okay, much better. So ordinarily, I would uh, have someone else come in and moderate the panel, but when I heard that uh, these gentlemen were going to be here, I said, no, I, I've got to do this because I have a, a real special interest in all of you and study your research. So I want to definitely share this information. So next to, uh, on uh, Mary Ann's right, is uh, Dr. Hal Prudov. Now, Dr. Halpuroff, he was actually, uh, along with uh, uh, Russ, Dr. Russell Tark, they were actually the, the creator, correct, of the first uh, remote viewing group. Uh, but in addition to that, I think what makes him also really unusual is that he is a nuclear engineer, correct, and also has uh, explored different areas in energy propulsion, zero point energy. Uh, anti-gravity, areas that a lot of scientists just won't, don't have the courage to explore, saying, no, this is not possible, this is not doable. But yet he's there at the forefront uh, of that. Uh, on my uh, right, I have... Uh, no, no, uh, on uh, uh, Dr. How, uh, Dr. Pudo's uh, uh, right is... Uh, excited about this, is uh, Thomas McNear. Actually, Thomas was, the, I believe, is the first uh, remote viewer trained by Ingo Swan. Uh, very military, correct. Uh, first member of the Army Stargate program. Personally uh, trained and coordinated remote viewing. And uh, the only member of Mr. Swan trained through stage six. Uh, Tom, in fact, uh, Ingo, a few times said he might be better, that uh, Tom was perhaps better than uh, himself, so that's something we're going to be exploring later on. Um, a, re uh, a fellow remote viewer wrote, Tom's results were not just impressive, some could even consider spectacular. And Tom would also, uh, sometime during the course of his uh, workshop, also give us a little remote viewing uh, Follow through. See what it's like to do a session. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and then to uh, Dr. Uh, Ballet's uh, left is uh, Blen Oliveri. She's an assistant professor and head of special collections at the University of West Georgia, where her work includes administering the papers and rare book collection of psychic writer and our artist, Ingo Swan, from 2009 to 2012. Lynn served as a Pacific Northwest curator at the University of Washington Libraries. 
So let's give him a big hand for him. Now, this is a very in-depth um, panel. We're going to cover a lot of points, but before we do that, um, I just want to have each panel introduce himself basically regarding this question, which is this. Much of what is written by Ingo Swan comes from really second-hand sources. And yet, all of you knew the man. Can you each tell us how did you get to know him? And what made him stand out from other gifted, um, clairvoyant subjects? With, uh, from starting with Dr. Uh, Valet. Well, I have some explaining to do because I'm not a psychic. Um, I'm not a star remote viewer, uh, and I'm not even a parapsychologist. Uh, however, I've been interested in parapsychology a long time, uh, since my early years in, in France and then, uh, and then in the United States. And I'm a computer scientist, or more exactly an information scientist. And I was at SRI actually shortly before uh, Dr. Prudhoff uh, started his project. We had been, uh, Hal and I had been a member, had been members of a group in Palo Alto in California um, that was a parapsychology research group, which was a, a volunteer organization that got together to look at this. And um, I joined SRI um, in those days. There was a little project at SRI called the Arpanet which turned out to be a prototype for the internet. SRI had machine number two. And I don't need to tell you how many computers today are on the internet. So um, I had the privilege of being part of that, um, of that uh, experiment, essentially. At that point, around the upper net, the people who actually built the infrastructure, which, by the way, is still there underneath what you do on the web, there were about 200 people spread across a number of universities, and SRI was one of the uh, one of the major centers. We had the Network Information Center, in which I, which for which I coded some of the some of the developments. And then uh, Dr. Pudov uh, brought his project to SRI, and then Ingo came to to SRI to join the project. So I'm very eternally grateful to have. Uh, uh, bringing me informally to the project, I was never. He never paid me. You know, <laughs> I, was, I was never on the payroll. The reason I was there was that Ingo and others had a deep interest in UFOs, and that was something that they couldn't reveal to their sponsors, who were the three-letter intelligence agencies that were sponsoring or going to sponsor the project. So that's how I became. Uh, sort of the uh, innocent bystander. And I met Ingo, and Ingo at that point was unhappy. Uh, now, how can you be unhappy when you're on a dream job like this in California, paid uh, with your travels, paid by a number of people? He was unhappy because he likes this city. He likes New York. Uh, all his friends are here. The weather changes in New York and California, and the sky is always blue, and it's kind of boring. So, and, and what he wanted to do really was frustrated with wanting to do more, and that, that, that this was the project that Dr. Pudov started was really an exception. It was the first time that physicists were going to do research on parapsychology. And furthermore, he was not going to look at wavy lines and little stars on cars, that he was going to look at technology. So he started interviewing scientists at SRI who were working on different types of machines, different types of, of, uh, of experiments, trying to understand the, that culture. And uh, so we started having lunch together and becoming friends. I mean, it was, uh, it was very warm. And, and by the way, I mean, this is not the usual panel for, for me, and I guess, for all of us, because there was a lot of emotion attached to working with Ingo, and there is still a lot of emotion, I think, in, in all of us. Um, I asked him, what is it exactly that you do? 
And he said, I can transfer my consciousness anywhere in space and time and um, bring information back. And I told him, look, I, I need to give you a quick briefing on how computer networks function and what we're currently doing. Because we, that's the same thing. We go get information across space and time. And if you, all of you who use Google today or use the web know that. In 1970 or 71, people didn't know that. People didn't realize the power that was in that, in that act. And I, I told him, in information science, we have different ways of addressing information. It could be, and I don't want to take much time, but it could be that the inf you have the exact address for the information and you go get it, or you only have an X which you're going to calculate that will give you the address where you have to go to get the address of where the information is. It's called indirect addressing. And then you have other forms of addressing, like virtual addressing, when the information is not even in the computer. When you use Google, the information is not in your computer. It will go into what's called now as a cloud and somehow statistically go through a hashing code to get to something like the information. And uh, that was really the, the uh, initial thrust for Ingo developing the uh, coordinate remote viewing uh, protocol. So that, that was the, the quick introduction to working with Ingo, and then we would go off and have a cup of coffee and talk about UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> I started out as an innocent physicist doing my laser research at uh, Stanford. And as it turns out, I, I did a textbook on for, for a graduate level on lasers and quantum electronics. And in that era, I had a problem that many people had, and that physicists had. And that is, well, we're talking about atoms, we're talking about molecules, lasers, and all that kind of stuff. But what about consciousness? I mean, this is all inanimate physics. This is all inanimate physics. What about animate physics? Uh, you know, is it still molecules and atoms all the way down? Or are there new fields or something like that? So I had an idea to do a pure physics experiment. It was a quantum biology experiment. And I wrote it up as a proposal and I passed it around. And... Uh, it turned out that Inko got to see a copy of my proposal. And so he wrote me a letter. And he said, well, if you're interested in the borderline between animate and inanimate physics, you shouldn't be doing the kind of experiments you're going to do with algae cultures. You should be dealing with somebody like me, because at least I can tell you what's happening. And ordinarily, I would have just thrown that in the garbage, except that he included with his letter a description of some experiments that he did uh, City College in New York, where from a distance he would raise and lower the temperature of some temperature measuring devices. So as a physicist, that, that was interesting, so I decided to invite him out to SRI, just on a lark, and I talked to my physics colleagues and said, oh my God, these guys are all frozen and charlatans. <laughs> you know, you better really have something good. Well, it turned out I did have something good. We had a very sensitive magnetic field device, but it was inside of electrical shielding, it was inside of uh, it was acoustically isolated, it was inside of magnetic shielding, it was inside of superconducting shielding. This is something the Navy had built that nothing could to get inside of. So anyway, when he showed up, I said, uh, well, we're going to do this experiment. It's kind of like looking inside of a box or something. And so I took him to this place, and here's this thing mounted below the floor of the physics building. He said, well, I, I've got to look in there and see, see what happens. I don't know, we can't take it apart. It's no, 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 I don't mean that way. So anyway, over the next couple of hours, as he, look, quote, looked into the device, first of all, the device output went bananas. It was one of the best PK experiments anybody could ever see. But beyond that, he even wrote up the inside of what was inside the device, which had never been published, what we would now call remote viewing. So that was really staggering. So I wrote it up and I passed it around. And pretty soon, the CIA came knocking on my door. <laughs> they couldn't 
could care less about the PK, but the idea that he could actually see through shielding. And then they dropped a big telephone-sized book on my desk. This is what the Russians have been doing for 10 years, millions of dollars, exploiting ESP, and nobody in America even believes there is such a thing. And so, but you did this experiment, you looked into your background, you used to be a naval intelligence officer at NSA, blah, blah, blah. You're at SRI, we have a lot of black projects here. Would you mind looking into this? So it was just a lark. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll do this. thought it was just going to be a little side project. So obviously in <coughs> taking on this project, I got to know Ingo really well. And of course, we started out with the things that you might think of doing. You know, putting things in boxes, could you describe them? More sophisticated things, you know, lasers on in another laboratory, could you tell if it was on or off or whatever. And then one day he said, you know, I'm really bored, I'm going back to New York. It's this trivializing my ability. You want to know what's in the box, but look. <laughs> so I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, uh, just send somebody out in the San Francisco Bay Area and I'll describe where they are. I said, oh, God, you know, that's really crazy. <laughs> but anyway, he's going to quit, so we sent somebody out. And he did. He did describe where the person went. We did a whole series of those experiments. So I finally had to report back to the CIA. Now, it turns out, they were not happy with this. <laughs> they were hoping we'd say, oh, this is all nonsense. It doesn't work. We don't have to worry about the Russians. They're not getting anywhere. And so here we're turning out these good results. And so they decided to test us by giving coordinates, as Shock had suggested. It turned out to be a super underground NSA facility. And uh, we got data out of that. And then the law enforcement apparatus descended on us. How did we get the data? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, in that process, uh, over many years, uh, it, it grew. And it turned out we ended up <coughs> training Army intelligence uh, officers to do it, which Tom McNair will speak to. But anyway, as far as Ingo the person goes, uh, he's really different from what you might think typical psychics or clair typical psychics or clairvoyants would be from, say, TV shows or whatever. Ordinarily, uh, people who might be into psychism, uh, reading tarot cards or whatever, they'll try to take credit for anything, even if it didn't quite match. <laughs> Ingo was just the opposite. He was absolutely a pristine scientist. If there were even a possibility of a loophole in some experiment, uh, he didn't want to see it counted because he knew if there's a loophole, somebody would find it, and this isn't working again. Right? <laughs> so anyway, uh, over the time, he was absolutely a martinet in doing good work. And that was finally recognized all throughout our government intelligence agencies and so on, to the point where then he began training other people. And the truth of the matter is, he's an absolute most inspiring person I think I've ever worked with. He's focused. In fact, he's warm and gentle, as you said, and absolutely pristine in his thought patterns. And so it, it, it's just a really unusual, a Renaissance man for sure. Well, as you saw from the documentary, Inga was an artist and a writer. He, for me, was a teacher and mentor. He was a visionary. He was an intergalactic psychic time traveler. And over the two and a half years of my working with him, he became a, a good friend. Uh, the Ingo I knew, like Hal said, gave very freely of himself and expected little in return from others. He could be cantankerous and, and difficult to get along with at times, but he never was with me. As I said in the documentary, we got along very well. Uh, after he passed, my wife Faye and I spent two days helping to sort his books from his library. And we were surprised how many people had sent him books and manuscripts asking him to read them and respond to them. Uh, he would 
keep the letter that came with the book and his response and tuck them in the book. So we took the time to read a few of those. And it was amazing. He would read their book. He would take a great deal of time to write a detailed response of what he thought of their book. He usually focused on the positive aspects of it. Um, and he even apologized to somebody once for taking so long to respond. What he was apologizing for was the fact that the 9-11 attacks here in New York City had impacted his ability to be more timely in his response. Uh, personally, Ingo was a different generation than me. He was 19 years older than me. He was like my older brother sometimes, sometimes like a father or a grandfather giving me sage advice. He never withheld that advice. Um, but mostly he was my friend. And when we were here in his studio, some of the couches that you see over at the Highline Hotel used to be in Ingo's studio. Sometimes we would sit on one of those couches. We could sit there for more than an hour and never say a word to one another. I guess friends don't need words. But as Ingo wrote in one of his books called Purple Fables, we were in our temple of sanity pretending to be sane. And, and that's the Ingo I knew. I met Ingo in the late 90s. Um, around that period of time, I'd actually been involved with the um, one of the early uh, groups called SciTech, um, who first brought remote viewing public. I was living in LA with my husband, Robert, and we got involved with that group of people. So I had quite a background on remote viewing before I met Ingo. And essentially, having gone to a lot of SNC conferences and parapsychology conferences, um, this led to meeting people like Hal and other people in the field. Um, Ingo, when I first met him, actually came to our house for dinner, and I remember he said something very odd to me because I'd gone through a very stressful period. He looked at me and he said, your aura is shattered, and I didn't really quite know how to take that because nobody had ever said anything like that before, but it was a very profound comment, which I think, you know, I've always carried with me in my relationship with him. Um, so over the years, my husband Rob and I, we developed a real friendship with him. I've worked as a professional photographer now for 35 years and more recently as a filmmaker. And I think because of my emphasis in visual arts, um, this was something I really related to with Ingo and his work as an artist and a painter. And I, in the mid uh, 2000, I actually learned remote viewing uh, myself um, from Angela Thompson, and um, I you know, learned the various stages of the protocol, and this seems to be going on and off at the moment. Okay. Um, so anyway, you know, that allowed me to get a much clearer overview of remote viewing. Um, I can say, you know, it definitely works as a platform. Um, it was quite extraordinary. It is definitely a bridgeway to our intuitive abilities. And in some sense, it's helped me with the making of this film because I think the idea of the signal line as well, and actually Tom's going to walk us through a remote viewing session, has helped me in correlating and following the threads of this short film that I made. Um, so it's kind of helped me in that way. So anyway. <laughs> Well, I, I didn't know Ingo personally. Um, his papers, and I, I first met um, Ingo's family um, in 2013 after he had passed. Um, his papers and his book collection, which I cured, um, tell a lot about Ingo and, and actually attest to everything everyone has said up here <laughs> in full. Um, and most noticeably about Ingo is, um, as far as his personal characteristics and what sets him apart, is um, his meticulousness. And you see that in his notes and his writings and in his drawings. And he was so evidently such 
um, had such extraordinary intellectual abilities and artistic abilities that he did, he very much a Renaissance man, sort of fused this um, a very creative uh, possibilities, limitlessness, um, with a, a meticulousness and sort of an engineering and, and scientific approach to things, which is highly unusual in people. And that Ingo did it um, with an extraordinary level of mastery. Um, so that's my brief comment on it. <laughs> So, from the group, how many of you actually have remote, remote viewed? <laughs> the reason I didn't raise my hand is that when the CIA showed up, they said, we have one rule. We learned in the days of LSD that the people responsible for investigation should never get involved in and, and, uh, since we know it you know, might be polygraph, we wouldn't even cheat. So, after I left the program, I did a little more. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, there is like a, an explicit uh, uh, description of remote viewing, but from an insider's perspective, and maybe that's where maybe Tom can guide us through it. That would be a good idea to really uh, mm -hmm. uh, pass the mic to my tongue. Maybe you give us an insider's view. Well, Ingo broke remote viewing down into seven stages, and each stage built one on the other. Um, I'm not going to try and teach you to remote view here, but I, what I will do, and I have to write this down, is walk you through the different stages and let you form in your own mind um, what it's like to remote view. Um, so the, the stage one is basically a gestalt of, it's the, the primary aspect of the sight. And after that, the normal uh, five senses, sight, sound, hearing, um, taste, those come, start coming in. Stage three is when you start getting some sense of what the site is like, um, but it's sort of general. Stage four is when those general things start to become things and start to become in more detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through one. Now, many people think that when you're out, you close your eyes and think about it. Well, some, some do. Um, there's a form of remote viewing that people do that. But for most of us, we remote view with our eyes open. So I'm going to ask you to keep your eyes open. And as I go through this, start imagining in your mind, much the way you see a picture in your mind when you're reading a very good book, that's what you're going to see. So you are now sitting at the other end of the table from me. You're the remote viewer and I'm your monitor. And I'm going to use a coordinate, which is the way I was instructed. So your target is one, two, three, north, four, five, six, west. And from that, you start getting a sense of land and water. Don't try and turn that into anything else. All you know is the general gestalt of this site is land and water. After that, the stage twos from our normal five senses start coming in. Now, you guys should be picturing this in your mind. You hear sounds, see sounds. You feel a breeze on your skin. You feel the warmth of sun on your skin. You get saltwater smells. The colors blue and white are present. You get the feel of wet sand in your hands and under your feet. So you get to that, you're starting to get a sense of what this might be, and then all of a sudden you get a warm and relaxing feeling. That's what we call an aesthetic impact. That's how the sight is starting to affect you. And then you go to stage three from there, and it might be long, low, and small. Not very detailed, but then stage four starts rolling in, and long starts turning into 320 meters and you you see sand and blue water and palm trees white sand and then at that point 
you should be seeing in your mind right now an island. And what you're seeing in your mind is basically what a remote viewer sees when they're viewing. They're not seeing it right in front of themselves. Um, it's subliminal. It's in the mind. Now, with practice, you start getting more and more at the site and less and less in the remote viewing room. But at the end, you summarize everything. So what we have is an island. The water is blue. The sand is white. It's daytime there because you can feel the sun on your skin. It's breezy there. Um, the water is blue. The land is white. And that is what it's like to do a remote viewing session. Now, along with this, you would be, you would be sketching out what the site looks like. But can I see a show of hands? How many of you were seeing an island in your mind by the time we went through that? <coughs> a good number. A little practice and you'll all get there. <laughs> can I add something? Sure. So, once a project was starting, uh, Ingo wanted to start training some people, some essentially guinea pigs, to be clear, uh, to refine the methodology that Tom just described. And I was one of the guinea pigs. So at that point, you paid me. So <laughs> <laughs> I had left that as uh, And um, so there was this little room on the third floor that nobody knew about that was essentially a blank on the table and a chair at one end and a chair at the other end and some white paper and pencil. And that was the extent of it. And uh, so we went through the training. And I was trained in those different phases. And so, on. And then, um, so I learned, you know, um, as, as you said, Ingo was very much a scientist and was very formal in, in that training and insisted on the signal signal line. And I, I got it, and it was more, you know, some sessions were positive and some I didn't get it. I remember one, one time that illustrates what, what you just said, when uh, we sat down for the first session of the morning, and Ingo opened the folder and gave me the longitude and the latitude, and immediately I had vertical. I had to grab the table. I was cold. Uh, there was wind around me. Uh, I was disoriented. And I, I, I told Ingo, uh, because this was a, a case where I had just gone to the last stage without going through the intermediate steps that he insisted on. And uh, I had no control over that. And he said, where are you? And I said, I'm on top of a mountain and there are precipices all the way around me, and I'm scared, and I have heard you. And he closed the folder, and he said, go home. And I said, but, you know, where was it? He said, you're on top of a peak in the Andes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I said, well, you know, this was pretty good. I mean, what? <laughs> I said, I don't want you to lose the, what you've just learned. I don't want to do anything else just today. I mean, you're on vacation. And that was, that was my experience with with the movie. You know, always wanted to end on a high. Uh -huh. And that's why um, you had reached a new breakthrough. And just like in sports training, where when you throw a really fast pitch or you do a particularly good high jump, you should end for the day so that your mind and body can incorporate that new understanding. And so that was Ingo's way of training. So I'm curious as to uh, how, uh, uh, Dr. Ha -ha, how uh, did you and Russell Park originally came up with the idea of, of creating a program? I mean, what came first, chicken or the egg? Which one? You said Ingo came in and then we saw oh, you already had it, a theoretical framework. For uh, remote viewing, uh, how can you just give us a little backstory? <clears throat> it's really pretty much as I even described in a little bit, bit of detail before, and that is, <clears throat> I had no idea of starting a parapsychology program. I was interested in parapsychology, but uh, 
it was only by this happenstantial thing where he volunteered to do an experiment if we wanted to see it, we did this magnetometer thing, and then the CIA landed on the doorstep. Uh, so it just sort of grew from there, and uh, in my mind, it was going to be a lark. I didn't know it was going to turn into a $20 million, 20-year program and so on. Um, but an element I, I, I would like to, to mention about uh, Ingo as, as I got to know him and so on, you know, I, I would ask him, you know, why are you doing this? Why? I mean, you can do it. It's a talent, obviously, quite a skill, but, you know, what really lies behind this? And he said, you know, what really lies behind this is that for whatever reason, I've realized that human beings are much more than we usually think of, that we take for granted. And so I realize that by pursuing this, to the degree that other people can get an idea of what I'm doing, the real thing is that they'll learn how much more there is to a human being than we usually take for granted. And this actually came, came to, a, to, to a real head. We were presenting a whole lot of results to a uh, congressional intelligence committee and uh, at the end, the head of the intelligence committee came up and said, well, I know why we're doing this. It's so important for national security. We're getting all these great results on Russian science and all that. But the truth of the matter is, the most important thing is what it tells us about the human potential. So he really got it, and that, that was Ingo's driving goal. And so even skeptics you know, <clears throat> coming at him or whatever, didn't phase him a bit. He just knew it was going to take a little longer for them to get it. Uh, in the course of your, in this, I, I'm addressing this to the, the, the whole panel. Uh, did he attempt to offer an explanation for the source of, of remote viewing of, of these powers or abilities or skills, however you want to call them? Is there a framework, a uh, something that the average person might be able to understand was an experience in what we will view. Yeah, um, Ingo didn't try and explain it, how it's happening. That's for the physicist, Dr. Putoff. Um, he wanted to make sure that it worked. He wanted to show that it worked, that we had these capabilities. And it's described as a paranormal function sometimes. But paranormal simply means that it's beyond scientific explanation. Um, in 1930, Rabindranath Tragora said to Albert Einstein, the table I perceive is perceptible by the same kind of consciousness which I possess. That sort of takes it out of the paranormal. If I can touch the table, I have the sense of touch. If I see it, I have eyes. If that table is on a planet in a distant universe, and I can still perceive it, something in my consciousness allows me to do that. So I think Ingo saw it as that, not a paranormal thing. It's something that we all possess. And he didn't want to explain it. He just wanted to do it. Of course, as scientists, we wanted to explain it. So we thought, well, maybe it's the brain waves that uh, ordinary brainwave frequencies, transmitting, whatever, whatever. So, of course, we put people into submarines and take them to the bottom of the ocean to remote view some place hundreds of miles away. They did even better. They said it was psychically quiet there and so on. But the truth of the matter is, although we never found out exactly how it worked, these days, science fact is overcoming science fiction. And we now understand from quantum theory, as Dr. Mal mentioned, uh, there's much more going on at the quantum level. We now have phenomena we call quantum entanglement, in which it's absolutely clear to a physicist in the equations on a piece of paper that we're all connected, that there are connections over time and space, and that they inherently underlie everything that occurs. So, uh, as we start to try to 
decide now how it all works. At least we know that similar things are already working in quantum theory, so maybe we'll get, get some of that. And, and Ingo really did try to explain it. I mean, I think, you know, he authored a dozen plus books in his uh, book, like Reality Boxes, you know, explicitly lays out the connections about, um, you know, the consciousness and tapping into the consciousness and those reality boxes that society or person, what are the physiological um, or other abilities that are required to do this sort of thing of remote viewing. And there's a lot of people who are working on trying to explain that physiologically as well. And then there's sort of that application of remote viewing. And it's been very interesting for me to learn about, you know, sort of that military application of remote viewing. But there's dozens of applications for it, one of which is really to explore that human potentiality, which is one of the most inspiring things about ego. I mean, just personally, deeply transformative in my life. Um, but then there's there's all these sort of there's business applications, there's uh, you know criminal justice applications. So it's been very interesting to look at it from a, a, a broad uh, perspective and see Ingo sort of within that dimensional sphere of, of practice. So, now this is the question to, uh, to Dr. Valet. Uh, you seem to have led almost. I'm, I'm actually reading Forbidden Science for the second time, part two. We read it a long time ago, we're reading it. It's really, for those who haven't read it, it's a great work. It, it, it brings you on the inside view of what, it, what that period was. It was a pretty amazing period. And so, you really, what I find most striking about the work, the research that you were doing, is that. Uh, it's very, you kind of juggling two worlds. You're, on the one end, you're, during the day, you're working on computer networks, and, and then the next sentence here you are talking about uh, exploring different, uh, uh, well, Fortiana, I would like to refer to, uh, different areas of, of human potential. So, uh, over the years, have you thought maybe there's a, in some way they complement each other? Or was there a way, were you doing this just to balance your own world, or was this simply their two simultaneous interests that you had? Well, um, it, it, it would have been impossible except in Silicon Valley at that particular time. Um, and it would have been impossible uh, without Dr. Pudoff and the, the environment that was created there. I had that conversation once with Dr. Federico Fagin, who is an Italian physicist in Silicon Valley, who was a founder of one company after the other. He was the uh, inventor of the integrated circuit, and uh, which he invented, by the way, one time when he was outside his body, and which he now admits, but at the time did not make you know, public. And I had that conversation with him saying, you know, how far should we go in spending time on parapsychology and so many, uh, so many other things to do and so many people who are against it. I mean, but, you know, let's not forget that, uh, you know, Hal and, and Russell were in an environment that was really, you know, intellectually opposed to this, this type of, of, of work. <coughs> Scientists are supposed to work on things that can touch it, detect it. And, and Federico said, well, it's very simple. The time we stop asking those questions, we might as well sell Silicon Valley to the Japanese. Because that's what we do. And, and there is no difference between working on uh, something like the Internet, which was an extraordinary jump into the future of technology, uh, going, by the way, against what industry wanted us to do. Okay? Uh, to create something that was really inspired by the idea of linking people together. And then this project, which was essentially trying to look for what is it about human consciousness that enables us to do that. And I think the two were 
to, to me, and I still do, I mean, I've, I've run five venture capital funds investing in startups. And um, what you find in, in the, the founders of, of these startups, the ones who are going to succeed, get it. I mean, there are people like that who are looking for something more than just being successful and making money. And I think if we, I hope that in Silicon Valley, there's a lot more money today than there was 20 years ago. And, but I, I hope that we don't lose that inspiration. So returning to that book, I mean, when I mentioned both, uh, there's uh, one or two references to you and early on you meeting uh, Dr. Pudov. Can you both, how you, when you first met each other, I mean, what were your impressions, like the, the spontaneous thing that came up? Uh, I guess you were in the same building, I believe, or you were at one point? Or, yeah. So you just give us a little bit of a background. <laughs> Well, as you can probably tell, uh, if it's just standard things, I get bored very fast. So <laughs> I'm always out there. Well, it turned out I'm interested in UFOs and search for extraterrestrial intelligence and so on. So when I met Jock, I already had read a number of his books, uh, Passport to Magonia and so on. And so I felt honored, actually. So it was a great privilege to get to meet Jacques. And I also knew that, obviously, from his interests and in the books he'd written, he's very open-minded. So it was just natural to uh, let him know about the remote viewing project. And he immediately had <coughs> ideas about how to help and use of coordinates, as, as described already turned out to be a boon to, to moving it forward. So right from the beginning, I just felt I was meeting you know, an icon that I already admired. Thank you. Um, we actually had met before, before the project started. I was at SRI, but as I said, I was a member of that parapsychology research group that, that met from time to time. And so. My, uh, my first reaction when I met uh, Hal was finally physicists are going to get into this and they're going to clean this mess because frankly <laughs> parapsychology up to then was uh, you know was, was a series of well-meaning approaches to things but they, they had never been coached in a, in a you know, formal classic you know, experimental, uh, experimental way, or, or rarely, uh, and there were experiments done, but they were never taken really to the next step in terms of what does this mean for the structure of the world, for the structure of the universe, what, what else can we do with it? And uh, how and Ingo set the standard for integrity in the field, you know, in, in the face of, of a, a lot of... Um, you know, they pretend to gloss over now, but it wasn't easy, okay? It wasn't easy. The funding went through all kinds of different phases. They had to make great sacrifices, all of them, you know, to continue the project and to restart it when somebody wanted to kill it, including people in, in Washington who wanted to kill it for ideological reasons, religious reasons, and, and other, other reasons. Um, I think only Hal knows about what I'm going to describe now. Um, at the, when the project was starting, it had very little money. And Ed Mitchell, I think, was one of the people who provided some startup money. At that point, I was working in, in one of the ARPANET groups, the group that developed the mouse and, and a, a lot of other things uh, under Dr. Douglas Inglewald. And um, the head of the division at SRI, Mandy Bart Cox, came into my office, closed the door. And he said, Jacques, we, I, I need to talk to you about something. Um, you've, done, you've gone far out on some of your books and some of the stuff about UFOs, and you've managed to do that without losing your integrity or losing your reputation, which is why you're at SRI. 
we learn we need to learn to do that because as you know there is a project that is started uh, on you know, psychic research and um, let me draw something on your wall and he drew a scale and on the right side of the scale he drew a large square and he wrote a hundred million dollars that was the you know the revenue to SRI of ongoing research for companies, you know, Xerox and General Electric and, and Bank of America and on and on. And on the left, he drew a little, a tiny little square, and he says, and he wrote one million dollars. And he says, this is the most we can ever expect to get from research on psychic stuff. Uh, and there are a lot of people around here, including people on the board of SRI, which is a very powerful board, who, uh, you know, are wondering about that. Should we endanger the $100 million with the prospects of maybe getting a million a year for a few years? And I said, you know, one reason we're here at SRI is that we take chances with technology. People, the reason we work for Bank of America and Xerox is that they came to us to fix problems that their own scientists couldn't fix. We're, and we're not going to do that by just keeping doing the classical things that everybody else does in the scientific community. We've got to take chances at the frontier. And he said, well, you know, write me a memo about that. And I wrote a memo where I, just for his eyes only, that said, look, under normal circumstances, a project like this wouldn't have any chance because the scientific community is against the paranormal. Paranormal is viewed as, you know, some people view it as the, the work of the devil. Other people say we're going back to the dark ages, you know, believing in woo-woo stuff, you know, and that's not serious science, okay? But the fact, so the fact that this would be classified gives us, and it's going to, to give those guys a runway under which, an umbrella under which they will be shielded from that kind of controversy and they can get to some results. And the second part of my memo said, those results should be published to the extent that they have to do with perception, with consciousness. You know, let's not talk about Russian submarines, but let's talk about what we are learning along the way about the statistical methodology which was developed at SRI that had never been developed before about the, the channel of perception, you know, about the, the aspects of consciousness that were being discovered. And I said, let's not have a completely classified project. I think that's not what SRI should be doing. Let's use the shield of classification with, you know, the CIA and others to protect the, the, the scientists who are going to take a chance on this project long enough so that we can publish stuff that will be of interest to everybody. And that's what we did. One thing I noticed uh, when I got the documentary from Marianne is that uh, you mentioned uh, that Ingo was a good friend of Philip K. Dick. Yeah. I was, I mean, I read a little bit of Philip K. Dick in the last few years, but that was a surprise. But then again, Philip K. Dick knew all the cool people, so in a way it was not a surprise. <laughs> so can you tell me how they met or what can pass So Ingo would speak about how actually a, quite, there were a few writers um, connected with the science fiction area that would come to visit him in the 70s. And one of those people was Philip K. Dick and also Gene Roddenberry. And I think Ingo actually went to some of the early Star Trek sets actually as well. But I think you can see a lot of aspects well, of Philip K. Dick's work and Gene Roddenberry's um, you know, of Ingo's um, explorations that have affected that TV program. So, Glenn, uh, some of the artifact, uh, artifactual legacy of Ingo's works in Georgia. So tell us why Georgia and what are some of the materials? <coughs> <coughs> It does seem odd that Ingo's books and papers are in Georgia, doesn't it? <laughs> and, um, and interestingly enough, I'll just say, so we're at the University of West Georgia, 
which is in the Atlanta metropolitan area. Um, we also have large U.S. congressional collections, including the papers of Newt Gingrich. And to say that there are definite connections between what's going on in Washington, D.C. and military applications of, of uh, or other intelligence aspects of, of, of psychics in Washington, D.C. is profound, <laughs> sort of unexplored a little bit. <laughs> Might I suggest that after decades of managing congressional collections in various repositories. Um, so um, I got a call at, uh, and that the University of uh, Virginia had been contacted uh, by Ingo Swan's family uh, and that they had referred uh, the family down to the University of West Georgia. Um, and it was because of our large parapsychology collections. And we had uh, a psychology program that was very avant-garde, uh, starting in really the 60s and 70s, um, really focused on, on humanistic psychology. And they were sort of the, the, the students of Abraham Maslow. And in their teaching, they were looking at you know, the whole human and all the potentialities of the human experience and not judging like human behavior, but looking at a, a human very holistically. And so the curriculum at our psychology department included a course in which you had to slaughter a chicken to experience life and death and reflect upon that. And sort of, they, so they ended up drawing a, a lot of faculty who are really interested in exploring, uh, you know, human consciousness and, and so on. And, and eventually who came to work at our university was a fellow named Bill Roll. Um, and a lot of Bill Roll's work ended up focusing on poltergeist and so the faculty at my university ended up having a lot of connections with people who were practitioners of parapsychologists, and we ended up with some materials, some book collections from the uh, Psychical Research Foundation called the Hooks Books Collection, uh, Wayne Hooks, Wayne David Hooks Books. So we had, uh, and Bill Roll's papers themselves, which are heavily used as well. Um, and so we had these print collections on topics of, of parapsychology or, you know, esoteric topics. Um, and so, so Ingo's uh, papers and book collection were a, a really a very brilliant fit into our collections and we have an academic uh, focus at our university in parapsychology, in our psychology part, which is highly unusual. We're the only one in the United States. Um, and it's, it's really very, very important um, that uh, we have these parapsychology research collections which are open to the public and that we deliberately collect in this area because most universities don't. And, you know, you'll find repositories like Harvard who has, you know, uh, you know they, they might have a, a focus on witchcraft or they might have... Uh, you know, a, a book here or there that deals with palmistry or phrenology, and we collect comprehensively on parapsychology topics um, and parapsychology collections. And the, the real import of that is that, as, as Dr. Vallée sort of really intimated and emphasized, is that um, the intellectual academy wants to sort of keep their distance from what is unknown and what might be uncomfortable for a lot of people. And here we are in the, in the midst of one of the most politically conservative country counties and areas, regions of the whole United States, by the way. <laughs> and damn it, I do go out and talk about our parapsychology collections to the Rotary <laughs> Valet and I have a lot in common, especially in that inter information science framework, because today when you do a Google search, the results that you're getting back are absolutely framed to you. The, all those algorithms are built to you, to your geographic location, to everything that they know about your profile past searching habits, and based on what groups of people like you might believe or assume. And there's tremendous work coming out of UCLA's Eisenhower 
on studying this. Um, and what's important is to document and collect everything, the breadth of everything, because if I didn't collect in parapsychology, we would be missing a huge slice, a significant slice of the human experience. Uh, on that note, I remember when I was a student at Columbia University, I, uh, one of my papers was, I was working, I was uh, studying with uh, uh, Gallagher, Gallagher. And he, uh, psychology, and I uh, wrote uh, uh, a paper in parapsychology based upon the work of uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, I got a C minus. So when I challenged the uh, professor and said, well, "Listen, let's look at the data," he says, "Well, the only way I'm going to give you an A is if you get an A in the final exam." So I said, "Okay, I'll do it." So I ended up getting an A in the final exam and an A in the course. But uh, it goes to show you there is like an inherent bias against this, no matter how much information is out there uh, to the contrary. But uh, and on that note, I just want to add two points uh, regarding uh, Dr. Valet. Number one, we've actually, you know, it just, I was just looking over your, we've got your uh, master's in astrophysics from Leo, and that's what actually we've been doing our Philip K. Dick Festival for the last, we are in our fourth year this year, Leo University at uh, Leo Weed. So it's, uh, it's very synchronistic. Uh, now, Philip K. Dick talked about uh, when he had his uh, 2374 experiences, sort of uh, some people might regard it as a mystical or paranormal, referred to as something called valence, which is vast active living information or intelligence system. And in some ways, uh, you refer to a, a need for a new physics called the physics of information in order to uh, explain uh, the, a lot of the anomalous phenomena that's going on, that people are experiencing every day. So, in 19, when I read that book in Forbidden Science, you mentioned the physics of information. I think it's 1977 when you mention it. So it's 40 years later. Are we any closer? Have we made any advancements? Are we are still stuck in the old physics? Well, I'm, I'm very happy you, uh, you mentioned that. Because to me, that's the most important book by Philip Dick. It's a, it's, a, it's a book I, I'm trying to read once a year, <laughs> and my, my copy is an old paperback, mass paperback, heavily annotated, and I keep finding new things there. Um, I think he was, uh, it's absolutely prophetic of the, future, of the future of science, and of the problem that we're dealing with, you know, and the, the ability, you know, you said that Human beings have greater ability than we think we do. That was in part the great message of Ingo. I think I, they must have talked about that when, when he met with Philip Dick. Uh, obviously, it was very profound in terms of the impact on, on, on Philip Dick. And he was trying all his life to, to refine that and to, to get to that. Um, there is a, you know, one of the things you learn in physics that they mention to you in passing and then they never tell you why they said that is that um, energy and information are two sides of the same coin. But then they go on to teach you the physics of energy, you know, with mass and photons and neutrons and radiation and, and momentum and all that. They never say anything about the other. So... Uh, a few years ago, I was invited to give a TED talk on the future of physics, the next 60 years of physics, which you can find on YouTube. So if you put my name and TEDx Brussels, you're going to find that. It's only 15 minutes. And I told them, you give me 15 minutes, you know, I, I, can't, I, I can't do justice to... So they said, well, you can have 18 minutes. <laughs> I decided I'm not going to talk about the future of energy because I'm not, I don't consider myself really a physicist, but I can talk about the physics of information. And the, the two really should be going in parallel. And in the physics of information, you, you don't have space and time. Okay? Space and time are emergent properties. And, and quantum physicists are getting to that now. 
but I'm not, not yet teaching it. Right. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, getting to the idea that consciousness is really fundamental and not matter. And that consciousness and that time and space and dimensions and other dimensions are emer emerging from essentially the, the coincidences created around consciousness. And so I've quietly tried to develop this in, in my own little corner. I'm not ready to publish anything about it. Uh, I try to center on coincidences, and that's also something that all of us have noticed. That the moment you start uh, really placing your attention, you don't need to become a real viewer, but the moment you start placing your attention on some of the aspects of consciousness, strange things start happening that, that sometimes are ridiculous. And it's a little bit like doing a Google search and you get three references that are interesting and you get 500 other things that you can understand why Google would think that it's related, but, uh, you know, and they, some of them are amusing and some of them are just meaningless coincidences. And um, I think that's an indication of how complex the the information universe is. At some point, somebody will have to reconcile, you know, the, the two. In other words, take relativity and quantum mechanics and then map it over to the information universe. I'm not the one who's going to do that. I, I can't do that. It's over my, my pay grade. <laughs> Marianne, in your documentary, you're, it's very refreshing because you not only present Ingo as a man with special abilities, a gifted, but also you portray him in a multifaceted way. So as a, a, a gifted person, an artist, a man very comfortable with his sexual orientation. I mean, that is, you, you describe this whole, pretty much in, actually in a short time, a lot about it. Uh, so what inspired you mentioned briefly earlier some of your what inspired you to direct the documentary. More important is why is Ingo more relevant now than say five years ago, ten years ago? What's so why do we why is Ingo so important right now? Uh, well I would start uh, the question with relevance because I feel like Ingo has always been relevant within the different groups of people he's been involved with. I think at this period of time, there happens to be more spotlight on him, really because of the estate, um, his sister Merlene and his niece Ellie, um, because they... <laughs> Uh, they have very carefully been very selective about where they've placed Ingo's legacy. And particularly with his artwork, um, a lot of it now resides at the AVAM, the American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore. And there's now a whole group of people that are viewing that artwork every day. Whereas prior to this, you know, Ingo had a lot of different parts of his life that he was very private about. And, you know, for example, a lot of those paintings nobody ever got to see, except for those of us who were fortunate enough to go and visit him. Um, so that's one aspect of it. Obviously, UWG is a big part of that as well. Um, my own role with it um, is that, I mean, really the estate wanted to preserve you know, Ingo's legacy, and so they commissioned me to work on this film about him, and that's what I'm doing. And I consider myself, you know, very fortunate because he's such a remarkable subject, and he's contributed to so many different levels. I mean, his whole biosphere is pretty remarkable. Uh, I remember, uh, believe, uh my first reading of Ingo was his uh, novel he wrote. Um, you know, there was a novel about a man who was able to alter systems with his mind. What's the name of the novel? Starfire. And there's something special about that, that novel because after reading it all, it's almost like we were talking about earlier in the uh, How to Build a Time Machine, the power of the image that he conjures is that at that moment, I wanted to go ahead and just develop my mind, really push it. So to a whole new level. 
And uh, that's something that really, I think, that's part of that, that legacy that he's really, you know, uh, asking everyone, every, every one of us to do. Now, to Al, uh, Ingo stated he had seen the being, remote view, the dark side of the moon. Uh, but yet, you know, within the remote viewing protocols, it had this, all this information sooner or later has to be verifiable. And, but more interesting, he mentioned uh, that he had seen some uh, alien structures or uh, artifacts. Can you please elaborate? Well, this is really challenging because uh, we don't actually have published verifications that uh, that material is there. Uh, on the other hand, given the quality of his remote viewing over many uh, aspects, I, I wouldn't reject it out of hand. It just couldn't possibly be. So it's on my gray shelf, and uh, I keep looking wherever I can to see if we're going to get some verification of it. As Jacques mentioned about coincidence, there's a lot of coincidences behind that because uh, the fact he got had that viewing was based on a very deep black program. And other people involved were uh, running into him in oddball places. I mean, it's, it's a whole scenario there, which you can get by reading his book, Penetration. But, uh, so I, th I think, you know, there's some possibility that uh, it might eventually be verified. Certainly in the case of, uh, for example, seeing a ring around Jupiter that's mentioned in the film, Carl Sagan, no one knew about the ring around Jupiter. So when Carl Sagan showed up and read the transcript, he says, oh, this is just all garbage. I only see stuff in there that you can get out of any encyclopedia. And then he's got things that are just dead wrong, like rings around Jupiter. <laughs> well, it turned out that then when the NASA flyby finally got there, there was this thin ring around Jupiter that was completely unknown. So given that uh, he would often come up with things that turned out to be unexpected, what turned out to be correct, uh, I give that some fair possibility. So I remember back in 1995, uh, I was watching the Nightline. It was a Bill Coppel came in and said, oh, well, we'll talk about the remote viewing. And it had been shut down, and the Army decided, well, it's just not worth it. So, so you know, obviously a lot of, a few books have been written about it. So, Tom, in your opinion, you know, uh, do you think they just gave up on it, or is there something? Probably there might be something else going on, but it's, they're not really. They have renamed it, or maybe just gone deep black, or, mm -hmm. <laughs> or no comment. <laughs> I will only say that I do not know of a remote viewing program functioning in the government today. If I knew, I couldn't tell you. Right. <laughs> and if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> so how much do you really want to know? <laughs> Actually, there is a new book out uh, called Phenomena by Annie Jacobson, in which she has looked into all of this it's a wonderful history of, of the program. And then she really got into research of what's happening now. Well, it turns out that she has found various programs in the Navy and elsewhere. It's all got new language. Uh, Sense-making, the fact that uh, have many examples coming out of Afghanistan and uh, the Iraq wars where troops would get flashes of intuition and it would turn out to be they saved their, their group as a result. So actually there's a whole neurophysiology and um, maybe psychologically oriented thing. So it's showing up again under new names. So it's to not have the baggage of uh, yeah. Jack, uh, you know, you study UFO extensively. Is there a the UFO experience. Is there a connection between remote viewing, UFOs, and other paranormal phenomena? Well, um, we, we don't have time for the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the short answer. That, uh, 
you know, scientifically, uh, both are very interesting because they ask the same, the same type of question. You know, what is consciousness? What is space and time? And how can we learn about the universe? Uh, and we know that eventually we are going to meet other forms of consciousness in space, but uh, perhaps the UFO phenomenon is teaching us something, something more that's relevant to the basic questions we're asking in physics. And I, again, I think that's, that's why we should be uh, interested in, in both. You know, they, when, you, when you really get down to the bottom, you know, they, they ask the same, the same thing. They, they teach the same, on the same problem. And to how your research really does cover a variety of topics, you know, from uh, remote viewing to all the way to trying to harness the, was it the Casimir effect and zero point energy. So, what is, is there a common platform that unites these? Well, we live in, a, in the universe. Everything has relationships to everything else. And so, in fact, uh, a particular area that I've been interested in is the underlying so-called vacuum fluctuations. And physicists recognize that much of the physics we have, whether it's gravity or electromagnetism or whatever, all emerges from this underlying sea of fluctuating energy. And it's pretty easy to, when you look at the details of it, to say, well, there are a lot of elements here that uh, sound a lot like consciousness. And so, in fact, famous physicist David Bohm talked about where well, there's the underlying implicate order whereby everything is connected. And then there's the so-called explicate order, which is matter and so on that we usually see. So for me, it is all interconnected. It's all emerging from a common base. And so as Jacques says, it's, it's trying to get at the roots of that, that common base. It's, it's our big challenge, but it's absolutely addictive. <laughs> Fair statement to say then, you know, in physics we talk about the concept of non locality. Say two, say two photons going in opposite directions, they actually know the information can actually go faster than the speed of light. Or at least they know each other instantly. Can it be fair, at least I said a hypothetical model, it's a model that consciousness may have some non local uh, properties and maybe at the, at the lowest or deepest level upon which everything else emerges. <laughs> I'd say that's absolutely a perfect statement. Exactly. So, uh, you know, so the, and it, well, a lot of people on the street, you know, don't know much about remote viewing. Or the first thing that comes to mind is obviously, well, you know, remote viewing. How come you're not, you know, predicting lottery tickets <laughs> or uh, <laughs> street rallies or like, go ahead and make a million dollars? <laughs> The truth is, they are, <laughs> but they're usually being quiet about it. I'll give an example. Uh, my wife was uh, founding a, a grammar school, and we had all the teachers hired, and suddenly we were $25,000 short, we about ready to open, open the doors. And so uh, I went to a wealthy dentist in the area, and I said, uh, you know, would you give us $25,000 for our school? He says, well, I read about you. You have that ESP program at SRI, don't you? I said, yeah. I said, tell you what, I do silver futures. If your people can tell me what's happening in the silver futures, I will follow your bet, and I will give you 10% of what I make. And don't worry, if I lose money, I won't charge you. So I took on the challenge to do silver futures. Now, I couldn't go to my military remote viewers and say, you know, can you help me out in this? But since by then we realized that this ability is distributed among the entire population, it's just a bell curve. Just like we have virtuosos of music and you get tone deaf people, but everybody can sort of you know, learn something. Same thing with remote viewing, that's what we found. So and since we had this stage procedure that Ingo had developed, I then went to the board of directors of the school and said, guess what? 
we're going to make money and so are futures. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you don't know about how to do this. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly the procedure because when you leave here today, you, you can use this if you want to. You might say, I'm going to ask them, are the super futures going up? Is it going down? Well, that's, that's too analytical. That, that, that's not the way to do it. So what I would do is I would just pick two objects. Let's say an apple and a pencil. And let's say I decide, well, if it goes up tomorrow, I'm going to show them an apple. If it goes down, I'm going to show them a pencil. And this is something you can all do to figure out who's going to win the Super Bowl or whatever. So anyway, uh, each day I pick two new objects. My board of directors would run through, we gave them a crash course in the first two stages, and they would describe the object that I was going to hand them the next day. Make a long story short, we went into the market for 30 days. He made $260,000. And we got 10%, uh, which is $26,000. So, in fact, it does work. <laughs> so, for, for those who are, you know, there, I think there are many would agree this out of a hunger for real spirituality. Is, and some will see, will think that, well, Studying remote viewing or starting special skills is the is the way to access that. So I just want to answer to the panel as a whole. What is your opinion on that? Is that the path of spirituality? I'm not just referring to being kind to other human beings, or but something more that we all connect at at a really deep level. Uh, is it an alternative to other practices such as yoga or meditation or? Um, is this is something that we can follow with that in mind, not just accessing information or what the Russians are doing, or, but to just get a sense we're all more connected as a sort of a global living entity. Well, I see remote viewing as an information channel for the viewer to be able to perceive information about other times and places, maybe dimensions. I don't really see the connectivity with spirituality. It's sort of like saying, how does the internet affect spirituality? They're both information channels. Um, I do believe that remote viewing helps us to better understand that we are more than our physical bodies, um, but I don't get my sense of spirituality from remote viewing. I would say the, the the experience of remote viewing, certainly in, in a number of remote viewers, uh, does tend to bring alive the idea that there is, really is more. And uh, in fact, uh, this is a perfect example. One of our remote viewers, uh, we brought in and we wanted him to affect a very sensitive magnetometer. So if we're sitting there waiting to start the experiment, he just happened to think of the magnetometer, and he saw the little needle move. And then he put his mind on something else, and was just sitting there, and he, he just slyly thought of the magnetometer again, and the needle moved. And he suddenly got the insight that, oh my God, that means even when I think of reaching for my coffee cup, there's an effect on the coffee cup. And then he got the feeling that that, well, that must mean that we're all interconnected. And when we think about other people, it has some effect, that there's some really big thing going on. He actually dropped out of the remote viewing program to study with a, a Tibetan teacher. <laughs> so at least for him, it did turn out to be opening the gates to the spiritual viewpoint of life. I agree with Tom for myself, it's not so connected with spirituality. Uh, but Ingo would talk about reality boxes, and I think remote viewing is proof of actually breaking out of your reality box and that model. I, I couldn't put it better than what, what Hal said. Um, I, I think. Uh, it is a channel of information, but when you practice it, it, it makes you aware of, the, of that connection that you were talking about. And if that connection exists, then it means it, it, it opens up 
an, an entire different way of looking at life, you know, looking at life, looking at death. And um, I was thinking of that one of the earlier movies was about AI. And does this AI going to supplant us and be better than us you know, at everything, including you know, reasoning and intelligence and science? And uh, it will if we don't recognize our spiritual ability, and and this is one of the one of the aspects of it that we should develop. At the past panel, there was a comment by um, you, Doctor. I think that you you do time travel. One of the purposes is to go back to the god to talk to the gods and then come back. That was such a profound comment, and I think there's several uh, times um, that I had in Ingo's writings where he has an instance of a godlike figure appearing in his um, logic. <coughs> kind of tumbled in. So, um, and then you think of Ingo's art particularly, um, I mean, in the book that he edited that was sort of a continuation of Dr. Raymond Piper's book called Cosmic Art. And that, I think, is definitely part of the tapping into sort of this maybe collective, maybe individualistic kind of uh, spirituality. And so maybe not remote viewing as a practice per se, but Ingo, in his pursuits of artistic pursuit and, and um, interest in understanding his world, I think definitely there was a, some sort of spiritual god, goddess, godly god, something <laughs> um, aspect to it. And you think about the Lightbringer piece, all the, all the art of the appearance of gods and um, divine beings. So I, I would say that that is actually maybe a very profound uh, aspect of it. And, and Mary, apparitions of Mary, I mean, there's just, I think, a, a good, a, lo a lot of examples of that in Ego's, Ego's work. So Mary Ann's mention, is it funny you mention uh, Real, was it reality boxes? Yeah. Because uh, you're familiar probably with Robert Anton Wilson. He yes. talked about reality tunnels. I actually had the privilege of us meeting him back in the 90s. And it seems that they're all on the same wavelength. Uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, when you go, people go out in the street and they're going to talk to their friends and, and they say, well, uh, many of them will say, no, that's, just, that's not real science. That's real science. Don't, why are you wasting your time? These are, what is your answer? Uh, I think my, uh, some people must say, just don't even bother. They're not at a certain level. What, how can you impart any information to them that make them maybe rethink their belief system? Just to anyone. I have kind of a, kind of a mantra about this. Is people in the world seem to fall into two categories in hearing about remote viewing. Those who investigate it know it works. Those who don't know it can't. <laughs> so the best thing you can do in talking to people who might be skeptical is to try to get them to take a look at the data. I, I would uh, agree with that. All you can do is you know, explain that that ability exists. It's something that some people you know, are better than others, uh, but that we can we can all either enjoy it or use it or at least be aware aware of it. And then there are moments probably it's not going to have an immediate impact. You know what we just said. It's just another thing. But there are there will be moments in a person's life where either. A striking coincidence or an encounter with, with someone or, you know, an event in their life or, um, uh, or, tra or tra a trauma in their life will make them aware of, of that, you know, of that ability. And that, uh, I think 
ex explaining that it exists and how it works, I think, helps uh, people integrate that in their own lives when it happens. Uh, so, kind of the special collection stuff, like people's papers um, and all the annotations in Ingo's books, I think that, um, it, not to get too artifactual about it, but there is something transformative about um, touching um, the papers of someone which has lasted beyond any human lifetime. And did that sort of that information sort of flowing free independent of time and space. Special collections materials and Ingo Swan's papers in particular, um, when you see the SRI binders, when you're reading all of Ingo's um, uh, creative writings and technical reports on coordinate remote viewing, um, and you are seeing sort of this vast evidence of, of Ingo's thoughts and practices, it is a way for you to tap into that. And it really, I mean, it is, ch it is changing. It changes you at a very <coughs> profound level. And I think that sort of artifactual evidence, there's, there's that uh, it is going on outside of time and space. And I think that could change somebody. these papers, or will there be publications from, from the library about, about oh, this? Question. Thank you, Dr. Bradley, for asking that. Um, so one way we provide access to Ingo's papers, which are completely open to the public, um, is because there's, there's you know, back 121 boxes of papers, right? It's extensive. And so what we have to do is right now we have, and it's, it's an iterative process of providing sort of an item or a box folder level inventory of Ingo's papers. And you can just Google and put in quotation marks Ingo Swan papers and you'll hit on the finding aid. Um, to his papers. And I think that, you know, I'm hoping that that scholars will come and do an edited volume of, of Ingo's letters, um, extensive correspondence, which is fascinating, and we are in the process of indexing that at an item level. So you can do a keyword or a name search on that. Um, and we do have an extensive number of people who are coming in to use Ingo's papers for a variety of reasons. Either they're um, you know, they're remote viewer practitioners or they're historians looking at the history of Cold, the Cold War in America and relations with Russia. So a lot of different applications and psychologists, of course, coming into use these papers as well. I'd like to take like 30 seconds to tie in to the previous section about time travel, about the question from the third aisle about what if you just went back and looked but you didn't actually travel. One of the sites that I was given, I was given a coordinate. Um, I described small green trees, birds singing. It was beautiful. It was very pleasant there. And then I was told, stay where you are and go back to, and they gave me a date about seven or eight years earlier. And then I was getting acrid smells, it was a forest fire. So in today's date, I was there. It was very pleasant because everything was growing back, but they took me back to another date, and there was a forest fire there. It was very unpleasant. So there's, I don't know if that's time travel, but that's going back and taking a peek. Just uh, very like a one-liner from each one of you, right? The future, uh, not yet. Uh, the future of remote viewing. Now, this could go on. This could go into another workshop, but the future of remote viewing, uh, present, future. Uh, very brief. <laughs> Many of the army intelligence officers who uh, now are retired from the service teach remote viewing courses. So in fact, uh, there are remote viewing courses going on all over the place. And uh, in fact, I, I still at least once a month give a PowerPoint presentation to one of the remote viewer teachers. So the fact that it's proliferating out there and they have conferences, yearly conferences, where people bring up the latest results they've gotten on solving crimes or whatever. I mean, I think it's just seeping out 
Uh, and so that's, I think it's, it's just going to continue to grow. I would just like to say as a director, I guess one of my mission statements is that I hope this film on Ingo actually inspires a whole new generation of remote viewers and people that are way outside of the military complex as well, um, you know, just in general, especially for younger people. There were two parts to the discussion, to the that lunch discussion I had with Ingo about addressing. Um, so here is Ingo, who is able to obtain information through some way of addressing the, the target. And what was invented was starting with longitude and latitude. And, but there is no, nothing sacred about that. You could use anything else as, as an address. The, the second part of that was, if we do that, you know, as, as a computer scientist, as an information scientist interested in consciousness, I'd like to know what is the addressing scheme used by consciousness. And I thought, if this works, I mean, the sponsors of the work are going to want to go in that direction because it would be a very fertile you know, line of research, of fundamental research on on, on, on communication. And uh, this was never done. And I understand why it was never done. It was never done because it worked. And as soon as the, the practice of remote viewing was seen as something that, that does work, then it was immediately applied, you know, in a series of, you know, brilliant series of experiments. And the, the sponsors were not fundamental, you know, when, not in fundamental research, so they're not in computer research, and they never circle back to the, the fundamental uh, information science questions that, that this was obviously raising. So I'm hoping that at some point somebody will do that. Yes. <laughs> Since we have an academic program in this, um, right now I'm working with a, a doctoral student, some of you might know, um, Deborah Katz, and, and one of her um, experiments is using remote viewing um, at a microscopic level of looking at um, pathogens and diseases. Oh, wow. Wow. Unfortunately, I've been informed that we went way over. I think we did some time travel. But what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to have three questions of the audience. But this is the caveat. It's going to be short, succinct, and to the point. We got three minutes. Okay, so I'm just going to whoever is uh, over there. UFOs and psychic function. Where do they fit in? Uh, um, quick answer, there are, there are correlations in, in two ways. First, uh, people like Ingo and many others uh, on the program had UFO experiences. And to some extent, I wouldn't say that, you know, let's not go into, you know, the UFO made me psychic, you know. <laughs> but uh, they, to, I think it's fair to say that to all of them, it was one of the factors that awaken them to the idea that there was something more to time and space than what we what we see every day. But the other direction is that, you know, many people off the street who have had UFO experiences, uh, the, it's not just seeing a spacecraft. There is a lot more to it, and the closer you are to the object, the more the, there will be an impact on your consciousness, physical, medical, physiological, you know, impact on your body, on your, you know, uh, on, on your existence, and, uh, and on your dreams later on, and on, on your relationships to others and so on. So, and it goes back, you know, all the way to some of the abduction stories that, that we hear. Uh, so, yes, it, it works in, in both of these directions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that gentleman over there, yeah, this, this is uh, the original man in the high castle from 1963. I won it at the Philip K. Dick Festival. I made uh, uh, three quarters of Philip K. Dick, and I won it in March. 
I am the living proof that uh, I, the French, uh, your theory that everything is on coincidence and that ballast exists works. And I would like to talk to you after and explain to you how I got this is the, the book that I wrote. My question is for the remote viewer. Um, I am a martial arts trained person and I have studied the art of Pushing Khan, which is the ninja martial arts. And Pushing Khan, we did remote viewing for the CIA, even believe it was possible. Do you guys know about that? <laughs> okay. uh, that gentleman over there. So, um, I'm wondering if, um, if, if there was some allusion made in the film to a scientist who had, had done brain scans. It's sort of a two-part question. A uh, bell, bell curve was mentioned. I'm wondering about the relative distribution of this ability or the, the potential for this ability in the population. And what, um, what kinds of characteristics in a person might lend want to be susceptible to this kind of potentiality. And, and, and corollary is, is there, any, um, is there anything being studied on the interface between psychiatry, uh, uh, neurology, and experimentation with these, the underground psychiatric movement of uh, ayahuasca and, um, and psilocybin and LSD with respect to remote viewing and related phenomena? With regard to the latter, I'm not, not aware of any, and certainly, <clears throat> at least in the CIA and DIA programs, uh, no drugs were ever used. It was considered it would be a distraction. Um, what was the first part? First bell part? curve. Oh, bell curve. I mean, we, we, we had so, so much evidence for the bell curve. Uh, it, it got to be that, for example, if a super skeptic from CIA showed up and he just couldn't believe what he was seeing, we always flipped the coin and decided to make him do it. And that actually saved our program once. <laughs> and he was very creative because he said, uh, even after seeing a good remote viewing experiment, well, then you would have probably told him in advance or whatever. So we made him do it. Uh, first time we made him do it, got a great result come back, and he says, I bet you had speakers on the walls. Oh, <laughs> so I don't want anybody with me anymore. Uh, and so, you know, we knock, knock down his objections one at a time. And uh, so it's, it's really it's more strongly represented in the population than, than you would think for certain. On the ayahuasca, I had the opportunity to uh, discuss exactly that point with Terence McKenna, and um, my my impression was that Raymond Ewing is exactly the opposite of. I mean, in, in Raymond Ewing, you know exactly where you are, and you, you start with a set of coordinates or some other thing, and you go to that place and, and, and not to. In ayahuasca, there are all these extraordinary experiences, but every time you you go to some place. And, but you can never get back to the same place. And uh, to me, that's really the problem with a lot of the, you know, altered states using drugs or using other techniques if they are not formally, you know, linked to, uh, to, to, to something physical. Remote viewing is very formal. This is question number four. We only do it question number three. We can talk to the actually privately, though. He'll be around. Uh, I will, uh, on that note, I want to thank every one of you.